Okay, so we've got uh, two people up for our next presentation here. Uh, Jerry Cornwell, he's one of the leading lighting designers in Canada with over 40 years experience as an award-winning independent designer with projects in museum, art gallery, commercial, institutional and residential markets. He conducts lighting education programs for the Illuminating Engineering Association. He has been a lifetime model railroader starting with Lionel, then HO and HON3 and discovered ON3 modeling with the MLM group in the Toronto area. His new layout is a freelance logging ON30 railroad set in central Ontario in the 1930s. There will be a layout tour in the new year, something to look forward to. Our other presenter this evening is Mike May, who uh, actually was a presenter for us uh, back in January. Uh, Mike has a real interest in theater, and to that end, his studies included theater lighting at Columbia College in Chicago. He's currently the vice president and director of rail events for American Heritage Railways uh, across the US and also in the UK. This is a position which makes use of both his theater and his railroad experience. His prior railroad experience includes being an Amtrak engineer and as of 2005 employment with the Durango and Silverton Railroad with subsequent qualification as a trainman, fireman, engineer and dispatcher on that narrow gauge railroad. If you saw his layout tour from January 11th Zoom meeting, then you know he has put his lighting knowledge to good use on his HON3 White Pass and Yukon layout. So with that, uh, we're going to learn all about lighting controls. <laughs> Thanks, Dave, for the uh, generous introduction. And uh, here we are. Now, I'm assuming we're seeing the correct screen, are we? Yes. Good. OK, thank you. And uh, we'll blast away here. Uh, we are going to move to, so um, Dave's done the introductions. Uh, the only thing we wanted to add to this was an um, uh, interesting little factoid. Um, Mike is also uh, an engineer on the, on the Durango and Silverton. And uh, I'm the former owner of Mount Albert. So um, we're coming at this from um, uh, both being involved in the lighting industry, but also being involved in model trains on, in, in Mike's case, prototype trains in a very major way. These two images are pictures from our own layouts. Uh, Mike's on the left, uh, his White Pass and Yukon HON3 layout. And my uh, ON30, um, this is the John Allen engine house from, from Mount Albert uh, that I just uh, finished building earlier this year. Okay, so what are we gonna try to do today? Um, our objectives here are to look at what are the first steps in lighting controls for your railroad? Um, how to assess costs and set a budget? Uh, what are your control options? And what are the hardware issues you're likely to come up against? And what we're not covering today is some lighting design basics. And if you want a review of those, you want to go back and check my presentation from last year, which is available on YouTube, um, on our, uh, also on the NNG site. And uh, you want to also check out Mike's lighting series in uh, September, November 2020 and January 2021 in the Gazette, uh, where he goes into quite a bit of detail on, uh, on the design approach that he took on, on the White Pass layout. So we're going to start off here with establishing some lighting goals. You, and you really want to set objectives of what your intent is. Um, it's, it's, it's quite difficult. It's not impossible, but it's quite difficult to build a railroad and then decide that you want to light it. Um, because now you're going to have to work over top of the railroad that you've already built, and that can be risky and messy and expensive. Um, so really want to set the objectives early in the process if you can, uh, find out what you want to do. So we're going to look at very from simple to complex. So the simplest thing to do is, is the basic, and that is white light only. So you're not trying to get a nighttime effect. You're not trying to get a day to night effect. You're just going to get a, um, light your railroad with white light. And this is what most people do because it's the easiest thing to do and it's the lowest cost thing to do. Um, the primary decisions for you will be the light color. That's the CCT or color um, co coordinated color temperature. The color rendering, that is the color rendering index CRI, and the light intensity, that is how much light do you need. Now, all of these things are referred to in the uh, presentation I did um, uh, earlier that you can, uh, you, can, you can visit on YouTube. And what we're going to do, what we're going to use to achieve our white light only will be strip LED fixtures, 
plus some LED accent lights to save power and heat generation. So you want to reduce the power and reduce the heat. Mostly heat uh, would be the biggest issue. Um, I also talked in the previous presentation about fading, and we won't get into that here, but you can't prevent fading um, uh, completely. Uh, the, you're always going to get some fading, and the worst thing is going to be scenery materials. So um, just keep in mind that that's something that's unavoidable. Uh, it's, it's light, it has photons, it's energy, it strikes the object, and it creates a, a reaction, photochemical reaction. So I'll get Mike to speak to this one, the switch day and night effect. Sure. So, uh, hey, everybody. Um, talking about uh, white only is, um, you know, like Jerry said, is sort of the, the starting basic. It's, it's what most of, you know, railroad photography and what we see in the, in uh, the real life. Um, so it's, it's, it's generally the, the start of everything, but second most common would probably be to do a nighttime effect. Um, now in talking about control switch night and day, um, in the world of lighting, what we would call these is a, is a two lighting systems. Um, it takes a separate set of, um, equipment, separate set of lights essentially to uh, make the daytime look versus the nighttime look. And what we're doing here is we're going to duplicate the lighting equipment that's on the layout and we're just going to be able to turn one on or the other on. It doesn't have anything in between um, as far as like, you know, fading or whatnot. So um, duplicating it, you know, you're talking about, uh, we figured about one and a half times the cost of a, um, of a basic system um, of just white light only. Um, that's because some of the equipment's uh, duplicatable, some of the electrical work that you might end up doing and some of the, uh, some of the lighting fixtures themselves. So it doesn't quite double, but um, it does go up in cost. Um, control, however, for doing something switched is incredibly easy. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about it later with um, <clears throat> some other slides here, but we talk about, um, you know, some just like Home Depot and Lowe's available equipment like that to just turn one thing on, turn the other thing off. Um, we can use the same type of equipment. We're still using LED fixtures um, and LED strips, um, but LED uh, strips now come in um, RGB. Um, so you can, uh, you can get any kind of color. RGB is red, green, blue, of course. Um, blue being the most important for nighttime effect. However, um, uh, if you look back to some of these, uh, the, the uh, article that I wrote or uh, Jerry's other uh, presentation, we'll talk a little bit about color rendering and how it's not really just blue, but it's a mix of a lot of different colors that come up with something cool. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's that's a little bit about the night effect and just switching between the two. Thanks, Mike. And just so you know, what we're going to be doing is uh, we will be looking at specific uh, costs um, in a moment when we start getting to the hardware. So the next step would be to look at going to a, what's called a diurnal effect or basically going from day to night. So you got that transfer now between the day effect, you'll be able to create some kind of a dusk effect, some kind of sunset, nighttime, and then dawn. So you've got a series of changes that are happening in the lighting. Um, and once again, it needs a bit more hardware, it needs a lot more control. So uh, a fairly significant cost increase, so about double what it would cost you to do the basic system. And of course, these numbers are very, you know, it, it, it depends on a number of factors, the size of the railroad. There are some, there are some uh, benefits of building actually a larger railroad. Your per foot is probably going to be a little bit less. Um, but costs can grow much more for automated systems. We'll talk about that next. Uh, the controls can be simple or complex. Once again, you can go to manual controls and do this with a manual step-by-step uh, -step thing where you're, you're, you're clicking buttons and making it happen, uh, which is perfectly fine. Um, and what we're going to use here is we're going to use dimmable LED strip fixtures. Now, notice I've added the word dimmable. Now, most LED strip fixtures that you're going to find at the, at the home center are not dimmable because they're basically replacing a fluorescent fixture in a garage or in a storage room or whatever. They don't need to be dimmable and dimmable ballasts are more expensive than non-dimmable ballasts or drivers in case of LEDs. So um, you will pay more for those. Um, the LED accent lights typically are dimmable. Um, we'll talk a bit about what that means later. And once again, we're using the LED RGB tape for color. Now, one, one thing to consider here is that you could start off doing dimmable fixtures for your layout, just do the um, daytime, nighttime effect with switches early on. And then when you've got the funds available, uh, go to the automated control and it could be designed that way. So you could add that later. 
Um, there's another step here. You could also use blue floodlights for the night effect, uh, which would be lower cost, but it would not be as uniform. So it is possible to do uh, individual floodlights. You wouldn't need as, uh, it wouldn't be as costly as doing a full um, RGB tape installation. And just so you know, the RGB tape typically, uh, in order to get su su uh, sufficient light, you need two strips. You can't do it with one. My layout is uh, maximum 30 inches deep um, back to the wall. It's basically goes around the wall, around the, around the basement. And um, the height is uh, roughly three and a half feet throw from where the lights are to where the layout is. And I needed two parallel uh, strips of RGB tape in order to get uh, enough, enough light, enough luminance. Okay, I th think we're gonna look at establishing a budget here. So what we've done here is we've priced this, uh, the materials based on uh, um, today's pricing from uh, Lowe's or Home Depot in the US. So we went on their websites and got uh, typical products. These are all brand name products. Um, the first thing somebody's gonna say is, oh, I can get that for $16 on Amazon. And you probably can, um, but you have no idea where it's from and you have no idea if there's a warranty attached to it. So. Um, we've used brand name Lithonia, you know, um, American, North American companies um, in terms of the fixtures. And, and we'll have some advice on sources, but you go back to the original presentation that we did last year uh, to see uh, more information on that. So LED strip fixtures are typically going to be about 40 bucks for four foot fixture and accent fixtures would be about $25 each. You just need basically a lamp holder. It doesn't have to be fancy at all. Um, the, the $40 and the $25 includes the light bulbs, the LED sources. So uh, that would be uh, included in that price. And the typical controls would be on off switches, which are seven bucks each. They're really inexpensive. Uh, there's a wireless remote option uh, for, for now, which is really reliable, uh, about $60 a piece. So significant price dump, jump. But what this means is you can control the lighting from anywhere in your layout. Now think what that means. If you're running your layout and you're doing an operating session, you want to change the lighting, you can do that from anywhere. You don't have to go back to the basement door or go back to somewhere else in the room in order to do that. Um, the wireless device is very small. It'll fit in your pocket or you can vel Velcro it, stick it on the front of the layout somewhere. It's where it's convenient and you don't have to have any wires going to it. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. So your estimated cost for about 12 linear feet of railroad is about 230 to 280 with a remote option, and which is about 20 to $23, 19 to $23 per linear foot. I think one thing to point out too about the wireless that um, Jerry and I chatted about is um, even though it is expensive, one of the nice things about it is it can reduce the amount of wire that you're running to actually put your lighting system together. And these days, copper is incredibly expensive. So there's probably going to be situations where going wireless is actually going to make it a cheaper installation than actually wiring everything together if the layout's large enough. And even if it's a break even, you're ahead of the curve because now you can control it from anywhere. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, let's look at a switch day and night effect. Um, what we've got here is we've got two pictures showing uh, a night effect on my layout. Um, and I'm using blue LED primarily with a little bit of white light in uh, to um, simulate the moonlight. Um, so if you look at the top right photograph, you'll see this is a wharf on my layout. Um, the, this juts out into the room. So the backdrop you're seeing behind there is temporary. It's held up in place for the, for the sake of the photograph <laughs> with the help of some clothes pins, I think. Um, and the little building on there doesn't actually sit on that wharf, but I wanted to show a building with lighting on it so you could see the effect of the, of the incandescent looking light um, at night. And one thing you'll notice is that this is primarily just the blue light lights, night lights on, but the little bit of white accent light, and you can see it on the dock. I don't know if you can see my, oh dear. Um, I don't like it when it does that. There we go. Uh, you can see here on the dock, you can probably see just a little bit of sheen here. And that's just a very, very low amount of white uh, accent light on top here, uh, just to give it like a moonlight uh, effect. And um, there's a, uh, this is an LED um, fixture, gooseneck fixture up top here. And on the inside of this building, there's a, uh, there's a, an oil lamp, lantern, lantern with an LED inside it sitting on top of a, of a, of a drum, a wooden drum. 
And uh, so you can see the, the effect of that light is actually shining on the door handle. So it gives, and it gives a little bit of light on the sky as well. Um, and I, this is the kind of thing I'm really interested in creating, is creating that effect that I can get with photography, but also when you're running the layout at night, it's kind of fun to see the, see the thing uh, lit up that way. And the photo below is um, trying to achieve an effect, a realistic effect of a lit building at night. And one of the things I really like about this photo is one of the things I was trying to achieve was this pattern of light on the ground here outside. That's from the light coming through this window. And the pattern is being created by the muntins of the window. Um, so all I've done here is light this the way it would have been lit. It's called a practical in theatrical terms. Um, it's, a, it's a fixture that models a real fixture and it's located in the right place. And it's about the uh, proper amount, relative amount of light. Um, and you can see the, uh, the effect of that. So the switch day and night effect on pricing, um, your typical fixtures again are the same um, as we had before. The, uh, the LED color fixtures, um, uh, we've, we put a price in here for the, for the LED strip. So it's about $50 for 24 feet. And um, uh, once again, this is available from, uh, from Home Depot or Lowe's. The typical controls, once again, we're just manually switching this. So it's only seven bucks and uh, per circuit. And the wireless option is 60. So the estimated cost for about 12 linear feet here has jumped up to about 290 or th uh, 390 with a remote option. You notice it's a bigger increase and that's because you need more of the wireless switches and they're $60 each. So um, uh, it, it increases the cost fairly dramatically. And it goes up to 24 to $32 per linear foot of railroad. Okay, Mike's gonna to speak to us now about uh, a manually dim day to night effect. Yeah, so, so diurnal, like we talked about, is um, it's beyond just day and night. Uh, diurnal is gonna now include um, all of the transition of what natural light does between day and night. So we're including um, dusk, sunset, um, dawn, all, all these different types of lights. So really uh, the, the increase in equipment goes up quite a bit. Um, we need to be able to create a lot of those colors. Now that's the advantage of using RGB tape or RGB fixtures of some sort, um, because you, you do have the ability to gain access to all those different colors within the original fixture. Um, <clears throat> Dimmable LED strip fixture, $70 per four foot. Um, again, it's, it's in line with what we've talked about before, but there's more of them or they're more complicated. Um, they're you know, the ones that are dimmable per red, green, or blue. Um, individual LEDs. Um, accent fixtures, the same thing. It's really just doubling. Um, there are LED accent fixtures out there that um, can you can control the color of them, um, but that does get quite a bit more complicated. So for this purpose, we just, we're just talking about multiple, multiple uh, sets of them. Um, typical controls, um, since we're just doing this manually, we're talking about household dimmers. Um, so they're not too, too expensive, 30 bucks a piece or so. Um, or you can go to wireless dimming, um, <clears throat> $65 a piece or so per channel. Um, there's a lot of ways to accomplish that. There's a lot of um, RGB LED tape now that actually comes with its own control system. Some of those are wireless as well. So there's a lot of ways to accomplish this, but the, I think the important part is to talk about that there's multiple systems of lighting involved um, and each is being controlled independently by its own um, dimmer switch or remote controlled dimmer. Um, if you look up in the, the photo up there, that's on my layout. It's a, it's a little bit like um, what Jerry was talking about where the street lights are practical. But then when you see on the, the blue is washed out with some warmer um, amberish light that's uh, simulating the sodium vapor. That's a combination of the light that's coming off the practical fixtures, but it's also an accent light that's hanging above the layout to, to cast those different pools. Um, same thing on the roof of the locomotive, so you can see the, um, the white highlights. Um, that's been a theatrical trick of mine for a long time that um, in nighttime, I, I like to simulate the, uh, the, the high color temperature, sort of whitish blue light of the moon, but I usually like to do it as a backlight. So instead of it lighting the front of something that you're really looking at, it's just creating those, those accents on the, on the edges of things. So, you know, to create this sort of effect that it gets expensive because we're talking about all these different pieces of lighting equipment that have to come in together and um, play nice together, um, which 
is why when we get into automated controls, it actually does make it a little bit easier, even though it's more expensive. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that leads right into our segue into our automatic dim night effect. So, so what would happen here is you would you'd be able to basically press a button and it runs through an entire sequence for your daytime, your dusk, your sunset, your nighttime, your dawn, and back to daytime again. Um, it's a significant cost increase, as you can imagine, because it takes a fair bit of electronics to accomplish all this. Um, it's the same as a previous slide in terms of the hardware, except you now have a programmable controller that's telling the, telling the dimmers what to do. So you get your automated sequence. The manual override allows special setups for photography. So you can, anytime you can freeze it or you can do whatever you want in terms of what's happening, or you can change the presets into different colors. Um, estimated cost per 12 linear feet is up to $1,000 or more. And a, one thing is that a single control system can control a fairly large amount of layout. So what we're gonna do next is we're going to go and look at um, some hardware. So back to our basic switches. So here's our simple uh, on off switch. Uh, you're, you've probably got a few dozen of these in your house already. Uh, single swole switch, single pole switch. This is a Decora style as they're called, these uh, uh, paddle switches that we've been around for a long time. Um, single pole, just basically on off. And uh, white is available all the time uh, from just about anybody, but they're also available in a bewildering variety of colors and finishes. You can get satin finishes, shiny finishes, and all kinds of colors, metallic finishes. Uh, they're mo mostly made for commercial markets, so they're not often available in the, in the home center, although you can often find the black ones in the home center. So uh, there's a little bit of choice available. If you want to get something more exotic, you're probably going to have to order it through an electrical distributor. Um, now, one caution here, if you're doing any 120 volt wiring, it must meet local codes. If you have a problem in your house and you have, God forbid, a fire, if you haven't wired it um, properly and they discover that, you are going to get a nasty surprise from your insurance company. So um, I, I really urge you, even if you want to do the wiring yourself and you're capable of doing that, have an electrician check it for you. Uh, make sure that you're legal. Um, we talked about remote switches. Uh, these are one. These are now available. This is a boxed item available uh, in the big box store. So their the, uh, Home Depot US carries this line. Uh, the Lutron Caseta. I use. I've used a lot of Lutron professionally, and I've been very satisfied with the quality, but also most more importantly with the technical support and the um, and the warranty. Uh, they're always excellent to deal with. Um, so this is the, a, a line of product they call Caseta, which has a number of different options in terms of uh, dimming, uh, wireless dimming control. And what you're seeing on the right here is what's in that box. And the key part here is this little, this little device right here. This is the wireless component. Now, this is the full size of that, and it's only about a quarter of an inch thick. Um, it's exactly the same size and shape as this piece right here on the Decora switch but this is now completely portable. It's got a hearing aid battery in the back and the hearing aid batteries, I've, I've got four of these in my house and they've, uh, we're on their 10th year and we haven't replaced a battery yet. So, and they're use all the time. So uh, they seem to be uh, uh, pretty much limitless um, and about 60 bucks, including the remote control at Home Depot for that package right there. And you can often see them on special as well. So here's a dimmer switch um, for doing your manual uh, dimmed effects. Um, so this is a single pole wireless dimmer. Now, this allows a preset light level. And what I want to explain now is what a, what a preset is, what it does. So if you look at the switch, you'll see we've got our regular paddle type of device here where you, you tap this and it does what you want it to do. But we've got a string of LEDs, there's seven of them here, which are going to give us an indication of what light level it's set at. Um, now, the light level, when you vary it, when you go up and down, is on a continuous spectrum. It doesn't go step, 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 but they do give you seven LEDs to give you an idea of where you're at in that, in that sequence. The little extra switch here allows you to control the dimmer itself in terms of where the light is uh, placed at, what level it's set at. So what's a preset? So what the happens with this switch, if the lights are off and you come into the room and you tap the switch, if you tap it twice, it goes to full bright. So you're going to get a full 120 volts, all right? Now, let's say you decide, well, that's a little bit too bright. So you tap the bottom of this switch right here, 
And this, these LEDs will light up to indicate where you're at. So let's say we set it at the third from the top here, this one here, this little green LED will be on, right? And that's, you like that set. So you just leave it like that. Now, when you go to turn it off, if you just tap it once, it'll turn it off. The next time you turn it on, you tap it once and it'll come back to that same preset light level. So it remembers the light level that it was set at, um, which is uh, really quite uh, handy when you're thinking about creating an effect and you want to be able to reproduce that effect. So this, uh, this particular uh, uh, switch is, is LED friendly. Um, they call it the Maestro LED Plus. And the, the word color at the end here is the color code uh, for the color, because as I said, they're available in a lot of different colors. Normally white is in stock, others you have to order. Uh, this is the same thing with a uh, remote uh, capability um, where this is a single pole remote wireless dimmer. And this is a Caseta uh, package. Uh, there's that name again, which is the, uh, their name for their wireless uh, uh, switches. So this is $65. So you pay significantly more, but you get the wireless. So the wireless here is this little unit on the right. And this is the switch full bright at the top. Um, turn it off at the bottom and up and down in between. And once again, you can preset that by holding one of these. You hold it, if it's on full bright, you push the down button and just hold it and then release it. It'll stop where you release it. So you can set a preset, quite handy. Readily available again, and that's, that's the key thing is it's not something you have to send away for. Okay, I'm gonna speak on this control unit and then Mike's gonna speak on, on the um, uh, uh, DMX type control unit. So this is an architectural control system by Lutron called the Graphic Eye with a zero to 10 volt interface for the RGB LED, LED tape that I'm using. This is expensive, budget about 2000 bucks for up to hundred linear feet of railroad. Uh, it's expandable. It has six channels and four presets. So my six channels are, I've got a dimmable fluorescent you're saying, why are you using fluorescent, Jerry? Well, I put my lighting in 10 years ago and there was no white LED uh, uh, lighting available 10 years ago that was any good. Um, so I've got dimmable fluorescent, I've got uh, dimmable LED accent lights, and I've got three circuits of um, LED RGB. That's one circuit for red, one for green, one for blue. And I've got a spare circuit that I'm gonna use for a sunset effect. Um, about two grand, as we mentioned before, it's got four presets, which you can, you can you know, predetermine. And uh, so I've got dawn, day, dusk, and night, and you can auto sequence them. So you can press a button and it does the whole thing for you. And this is what that thing looks like on the inside. Um, so the buttons are all arranged, uh, they're all LED lit, and you can just set the levels by pressing the up button or the down button until you're happy with what you've got. And then you can store that uh, in memory. Um, the pros to the system are out of the box, uh, it's, um, you can order it from pretty much any electrical supply house uh, that carries Lutron products or direct from Lutron. Um, it's easy to program. Uh, all you do is it's a bunch of, bunch of button sequences. Um, you can adjust the preset. You can adjust the fade rates in between the presets. So you can have a fade rate that's five seconds. It can be five minutes. Um, and you can also change the sequence timing as well. It's expandable. There's a zero to 10 volt interface available for uh, interfacing with zero to 10 volt like RGB tape. And it's remote ready. There's a little black dot on the on here, right here. This is the receiver for the remote. Uh, and the remote is actually wireless. It might look like it's infrared, but it's not. Um, I'm not sure why they do it that way, but uh, it, uh, it works great. And the downside is it's expensive and it's limited to four presets. And I'm going to ask Mike to speak about using a DMX type controller. Yeah, so, um, well, that's a, uh, what Jerry was talking about is a typical architectural type controller. In the theatrical and entertainment world, we use um, DMX controllers. And what that, what that stands for is digital multiplex. And really, that's the control protocol that most lighting equipment, um, any controllable lighting equipment, whether it's architectural or theatrical, for the most part, can speak DMX. Um, what DMX does is it's uh, on a single twisted pair of wire, um, which could be any simple wire. Um, it's able to handle 512 channels 
of control, each one having 255 steps of dimming. So basically you have a, you know, you've got from one to 255 of your brightness level, and you can do that for 512 different units at the same time. So it's, a, it's handles a lot of data. Um, it's very, very flexible for that reason too. Um, it's expensive, however, to uh, start something with DMX. However, the nice thing about it is that um, most controllers these days, there's some small ones out there, but um, the system that I'm using is called Camsys. This is a screenshot of it. It's actually software based. It would be able to handle thousands of channels on its own. So once you make the one investment, there's, I can't imagine a world where there's any layout that exists that couldn't use a single controller. Um, it's uh, like I mentioned, DMX is very standardized. So um, virtually any equipment you can find um, will speak it. Even if it speaks some sort of a proprietary control language, it will probably also uh, operate under DMX. Um, yeah, I guess uh, looking at the uh, control just a little bit, it's very similar to the hardware that Jerry was showing on the graphic eye, um, but it's software based. So on the bottom, those are, those are virtual little sliders and they're assignable to be which control channel that they're actually working on. Uh, yeah, right there. So uh, that first one would be like, say, channel one, that might be your daylight, and you can slide it up and down on the software, and it will it'll control the lights that way. Um, but then on the top, um, what that's called is a Q stack, and that's where this gets to be automated. And this is how a lot of entertainment work actually happens, where instead of having instead of having the four possible presets, or even on the simpler one where it's a single preset on the hardware, um, we're just controlling, um, we're, we're programming into the memory of the computer uh, virtually as many presets as you can imagine. Um, I, don't, I don't actually honestly know what the limit is of CAMSYS, but I'm sure it's in the tens of thousands. It's probably up to 100,000 different presets you could put in there. Um, and then the neat thing about presets, if you're doing the software-based, um, you can control um, anything about like the timing of how it's going to go from one preset to the next. You might, you might tell it how long a light takes to fade up, how long a light takes to fade down. Um, you might tell it to automatically when it's finished making one preset to jump to the next. Um, this is the programming on my layout, and you probably can't really see it unless you really squint, but um, it's the different cues are right now it's showing um, preset for noon. Um, there's two variations of it. The lights change a little bit, and then there's an evening, then there's sunset one, sunset two, um, civil twilight, nautical twilight, night. So each one of these is a different preset. They all have timing, and it matches the fast clock that I use on my layout. So when you start the fast clock, you start the lighting control, and you end up getting this full range of uh, day to night and back to day. So... Um, programmable controls, they're, uh, they're definitely complicated, but... Um, you know, the, the, the biggest advantage is once you invest in one, um, it's really easy to uh, expand that out on an entire layout. Um, this is the hardware side of DMX. Um, it looks a little complicated, but it's really not. Um, each one of those boxes is called a, a dimmer pack. Um, these two particular ones are controlling incandescent lights, not LED, but they make exactly the same thing for LED or fluorescent or you name it. Um, they come from many, many different manufacturers. And essentially what's happening in this is the dimmer pack is just plugged into wall power, 120 volts. Um, and then those little wires on the bottom, that's the DMX uh, signal that comes out of the computer through the USB. Um, and then each one of those pairs of outlets is, uh, would be um, this one. I, I think I have it set for channel one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So the first pack is one through four. The second is five through eight. Um, and then those will correspond in the software to that slider for channel one, channel two. It'll control the output of those. And then um, all that cabling just goes off to the lights themselves. Um, cool thing about this is it's, it's, again, it's limitless programming. You can do anything you want with it. Um, you can control them automatically or manually um, through the software. So like like uh, right now, for example, the layout's lit. I just have this turned on to be something that worked for Zoom. I thought it looked pretty, so I just left it there. It's not running anything automatic, but you can easily switch back and forth. Uh, the cons is that, of course, it's this is now getting really complicated in the setup and the programming. Um, but again, once you learn it, it's not... I wouldn't say it's, it's particularly difficult to learn if you're willing to put a little bit of time into it. Um, Another con is that expanding the layout, well, the controller will control a lot. You do need to continue to add um, things to be controlled, like the like these DMX dimmer packs or 
um, DMX lighting fixtures, for example. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. So uh, just quickly, we're going to uh, running a little short of time. So we're going to be uh, we're going to look th this part fairly quickly. But uh, some of the challenges you're going to face, are, and there are always issues with dimming. There have always been issues with dimming back in the incandescent days. It was pretty straightforward because it's resistive load, so it's not difficult to dim. Typically, uh, everything else is difficult to dim and prevents all kinds of, presents all kinds of uh, challenges. So compatibility with fixtures and control signals is the largest signal obstacle. Dimmer switches and LED drivers are usually sourced from different suppliers. So if you have a problem, of course, if you speak to the dimmer switch manufacturer, he'll say it's because of the LED and the LED manufacturer will say it's because of the dimmer switch. And you'll, because they're two different companies, they'll never, they'll never agree on whose fault it is. Um, the other thing is there's no current standards for design or performance of these items, especially for consumer products. So if you go to the home hardware or Home Depot and um, buy an LED screw-in LED lamp for your accent lighting, for example, and it says on the package, dimmable, in North America, what that means is that you can connect it to a 120 volt um, dimmer and it won't burst into flames. It doesn't tell you anything about the performance of the dimmer. And when someone says dimmer to a lighting guy, he's going to say, or she is going to say, um, I expect that to mean that I can go from zero to 100% on a nice even curve. And in the best of all possible worlds, I can control that curve, which in the theater world, of course, they can do quite easily. But the, the reality is that um, a lot of product, um, particularly gray market product, which comes in from Asia and it's not, you know, approved in North America, even though it says it is, um, it, uh, it doesn't perform. And when you dim it, it, it flickers or it dims down halfway and then goes out. Um, and so you really don't want to buy a large quantity of any of these things just because the price is cheap. You want to buy one and make really, really sure it works the way you want it to before you go out and invest in a bunch of them. Um, you want to buy from a reputable manufacturer and retailer. The ability to return an item that is not performing is really critical. And believe me, it will happen. Um, we, we, I was at a lighting industry event um, about a year ago, and we had a show of hands on uh, how many people in the room have had trouble with dimming LEDs. Every single person in that room put their hand up. So this is, this, is, this is an everyday problem and uh, it's something that'll happen to you if you're not careful. So make sure, you know, uh, buyer beware is the important thing here. Um, the dimming control options we've talked about. So standard line voltage systems like the Lutron um, Graphic Eye or any of the uh, wall switches that we looked at are, are the most common readily available and fairly reasonably priced. Um, the other option is zero to 10 volt systems, which work for LED luminaires, uh, requires a zero to 10 volt compatible dimmer and a zero to 10 volt compatible LED driver. Uh, but it does have some advantages in some places. Um, it's particularly good for controlling the LED tapes. And in fact, when you buy one of those LED tapes, which has a controller on it, that Mike controller with it that Mike uh, referred to, um, that is using uh, a zero to 10 volt uh, control. And um, the nice thing about it really is class two wiring, which means it doesn't have to be in conduit and it doesn't have to be, uh, it's basically like bell wire. So it's, uh, it, it's really easy to wire. Um, and the amount of control is very good. So that's, that's one option where you might save some money and get um, you know, pretty close to everything you need. And then DMX control protocol is the one we talked about earlier. And there are some proprietary solutions out there, which you know, from manufacturer to manufacturer are gonna vary somewhat. Um, that's a matter of doing a little bit of digging and find out what the results are and what you're likely to run, run into. So we're going to wrap up here with some sources, um, light fixtures, Home Depot, Lowe's. Uh, we just use regular stuff, all, pretty much all the stuff. Uh, I'm using dimming fluorescent ballasts, which are unusual, uh, but pretty much everything we referred to in the presentation are stuff that you can get um, uh, from um, Home Depot or Lowe's. The fixtures, the programmable R RGB floodlight fixtures that Mike are using are theatrical item. They would have to come from a uh, theatrical supplier. But um, there's a couple of other suppliers, online suppliers here indicated. Controls we've already talked about. Um, architectural lighting controls, there are many of these suppliers are online. 
And then if you want to dig a little deeper, um, local community theaters or universities, they've always got lighting nerds hanging around and, uh, and you've already met two and, you know, we're not too poisonous, I guess. So um, you'll find them, uh, oh, the lighting people are always willing to talk about lighting <laughs> with anybody. Uh, just get, try to get them to stop. Um, the IES, the Illuminating Engineering Society that I do work for, they have a, a reference called a ready reference, which is a free download at IES.org. Uh, there's a couple of screenshots on the right-hand side of the screen here. Um, and it's basically all kinds of technical data about lighting, color, uh, lamps, uh, light sources, uh, controls, all kinds of stuff. So uh, free of charge and uh, pretty easy to access. And USITT, which is the U.S. Institute for Theater Technology, they have a very um, good website as well where you can find all kinds of neat stuff. And I think that wraps us up. Uh, please use the chat box for questions. I believe Dave is going to host us for questions. Um, we threw these two quotes up. The first one was from Mike. The second one was from me. 99.9% .9 of the audience is unaware of the lighting, but a 100% is affected by it. Um, this is true for all lighting, uh, architectural lighting and theater lighting and everything. You know, you, people just go in, oh, that's wow, that's beautiful. You know, um, why is it beautiful? Well, it's beautiful because you can see it. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, Howard Branston, a uh, famous lighting designer, he lit some little statue that's out in the harbor near New York somewhere. Um, best lighting is the lighting that nobody notices. It just looks right. And uh, I speak to the same thing. You know, it's just the idea that lighting happens on a subconscious level. So it's a that's right. really cool art form for that reason. You know, we're, we're all used to what lighting ought to look like in the real world, but we don't really... We don't really break it down to what it what's causing it to be that way. So, a lighting designer friend of mine said that a lighting designer has the most impact on the success of a building, but nobody knows his or her name. Yeah. <laughs> and, and in the theater world, we always say that we don't want the audience to go back humming the lighting design. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, Dave, do you have any questions for us? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, that was. Uh, uh, really informative, and uh, I, it turn, turns out I've got dimmers on LED switches, but not to create effects. That was just simply to uh, match up one end of the tape to the other end at the point where I had to transition from one circuit to another. So it was just <laughs> simply a one-time eyeball adjustment. Um, actually, we've got, uh, I'll start with a comment, and this is from uh, uh, Chuck and Steve, and they said they've been using some uh, fight LED tapes from Home Depot. Uh, they said the power supplies seem to overheat pretty easily, but otherwise they provide uh, pretty nice minimal effects at a low cost. So there would be possibly some way to get into uh, into this in the big box store. Uh, oh, another question is from uh, uh, John Garrity, and he says, what's the difference between dawn and dusk presets? Oh, there you go. Wow. That's uh, well, first of all, first, you have to get up really early in the morning <laughs> yeah. and uh, you have to be outside at dusk in order to answer that question. But I'll let I'll let Mike answer that because that's right up his alley. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it, that gets pretty artistically nerdy. But um, <clears throat> dawn and dusk, I mean, a big piece of dusk has to do with what the, the effect that the sun has on the atmosphere when it goes right below the horizon. Um, usually I, this photograph that's uh, up right now, that's just before dusk, it, us it usually tends to be yellower um, and, and then kind of goes to a pinkish color. Um, mm -hmm. Dawn is usually a much cooler color because of the way the atmosphere reacts with the rising sun. And again, that sort of goes into that, that subconscious, you know, like if you were to look at it, if you were to walk outside, you'd probably recognize that it's either dawn or dusk, but you probably might not really know why it looks that way. Yeah, on my layout, the um, I've got uh, quite a bit more yellow in the dawn sequence and quite a bit more red in the dusk sequence. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm trying to get that idea of sunset. I'm trying to, you know, we're, we're creating effect here. It's the same with our trains, right? We're creating an effect. We're trying to, we're trying to recreate reality and um, uh, using an artificial, using artificial needs, You're using paint and plaster and, you know, all kinds of things. Um, so the same thing with the lighting. The lighting is a model. So what I'm trying to do is create an, an impact where people look at it and go, they know without having to ask, oh, that's obviously a dusk effect because it's got that little bit of red on the horizon and, you know, it feels like dusk, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And we had another question and this is um, uh, looking for, for a recommendation. And this is from Steve Haworth. And he says, 
For a typical low ceiling basement, are there any recommendations for an LED wide angle flood par 16 size or so? He says everything that he's looked at tended to be too narrow or too dim. He says, is there something, maybe museum fixtures or something that would, uh, that would be a, a good choice? Yeah, Steve, I'm using, um, I'm using a, a par 16 um, screw in a lamp from um, uh, Osram, Sylvania in the States. Um, under their Ultra Series ULTRA, which was developed for high-end retail. Uh, they're a little bit expensive, but they uh, beautiful color. They got a color rendering of around 92 or something like that, which is really good for an LED. And um, about 3,000 uh, Kelvin in terms of the color. So similar to halogen, a little bit warmer than halogen, but right about in the ballpark there. And it's a wide flood. It's what they call a wide flood. So it's about a 40-degree lamp. And I find that for most, um, you know, layouts, you're probably talking somewhere between three and a half to four and a half or five feet throw. It depends on your height of your ceiling, obviously. I have a fairly low ceiling in my basement. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say that, uh, look at something like that. Um, you'll probably find that the normal uh, over-the-counter, you know, in the, in the big box store lamps are there, the beams are too narrow. Uh, they use what's usually called a narrow flood, which is probably around a 25 to 30 degree. And you'll probably find that's a little bit too narrow because in a, in a residence, your typical throws from the ceiling to the wall or the ceiling to a desktop or something like that are going to be typically longer. They're going to be about five feet or more. And so, um, yeah, you need something really, really wide. Um, and the wider, the better, actually, I find. You don't want, you don't want round spots and round pools of light on your railroad. It doesn't look right. Because that doesn't happen in nature, right? Okay. Well, one simple thing I can add to that too, when you're looking at some of those par fixtures and things is generally speaking, if you don't know the quality of the light, um, if it's got a, a glass lens with any sort of diffusing or like strange pattern on the front, um, that's probably going to give you a better quality of light than anything that's got something clear on the front because it's, it's not, it doesn't have any way to sort of mix the beams up and um, smooth. But those, those same fixtures, Jerry, that you mentioned, that's actually exactly what's on my lab as well. Yeah. So I would second that. Okay. Uh, parabolic, I think it's a lamp shape. Um, yes, Jeff. Uh, uh, yeah, parabolic refers to a reflector shape, and that yeah. doesn't often apply to LEDs, but there are parabolic reflector mm -hmm. in the LED that... Um, the, with the LED chips is, is sitting on front of a, uh, or just behind a parabolic reflector. And that tends to throw the light out. Um, the difficulty with LEDs actually is creating a really narrow spot because the typical LED is throws off light at 120 degrees or something like that. So it's actually difficult to create. One of the things we had as a, as a tool in the incandescent days was this really wonderful halogen spot from Germany with a four degree beam. And it was spectacular for museum stuff. Um, and even for architectural applications, but uh, I haven't seen anything like that in LED yet. They're getting there with the big uh, floodlights they use for um, uh, for sports arenas, because of course you've got 300 foot throw, you need a really narrow beam. But uh, um, yeah, it's it's hard to do in a small lamp for sure. The uh, the sort of nerdy answer to what PAR refers to is it's actually parabolic aluminized reflector is the official. Uh. Boy, we're getting we're getting right into the trivia tonight. That's good. <laughs> that's, that's lamps you see like an outdoor flood where the whole thing is one glass piece. Um, the, what's in there is parabolic shape and it's it's coated with aluminum. Old old school old school uh, Christmas lights. Yep. Okay, guys, our fearless leader just put a note in the chat says time. So we're what up. That moves is is yeah. We're 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 going to thank you you gentlemen for for the presentation and the Q and A and. Uh, uh, move, move on to the next part of this program. Thank you for thank you for watching. Thank you.